All right, everybody, how you doing out there? This is Brad Listy. This is the Other People Podcast. I am here in Los Angeles, California. I hope you're doing okay, wherever you happen to be. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. In today's Friday flashback, you are going to hear me in conversation with best-selling author Jonathan Franzen. Jonathan Franzen has published six novels to date, most recently a book entitled Crossroads. He has also published five works of nonfiction, including The Discomfort Zone, Farther Away, and The End of the End of the Earth. Over the course of his career, Jonathan Franzen has received uh, a bunch of awards, the National Book Award, the James Tate Black Memorial Award, the Heartland Prize, Die Welt Literature Prize, the Budapest Grand Prize, and the first Carlos Fuentes Medal awarded at the Guadalajara International Book Fair. I spoke with Jonathan Franzen back in episode 426, just as the paperback edition of his best-selling novel, Purity, was being published. In this flashback, you will hear the two of us talking about a range of things, including writerly ambition, Jonathan's early love of genre fiction and its relationship to his skill in plotting his novels. We talk a bit about his childhood, some early mentors, some life-changing advice that he received from one of his college professors. And we also talk a bit about his love of birds and bird watching. I should also mention, as a matter of interest, that if you listen closely to this audio, you can hear you can hear my dearly departed French bulldog Walter drinking water in the background. And as I was listening to the playback, the memory came back to me. I was in the dining room for this episode inside my house. The garage that I'm in now was still under construction. It was not long after we had moved here and I was in the dining room. I'm talking to Jonathan Franzen and Walter walked into the room in the middle of it and decided to drink for like two very long minutes and there was nothing I could do. So if you pay attention, you can hear Walter rest in peace. And having said that, let's get to today's flashback from episode 426 It first aired on August 10th, 2016. Here I am in conversation with Jonathan Franzen. So uh, when you were, like when you were starting out, did you, did you, is this part of your plan? Did you ever think you were going to get to this place where, you know, I want to say the correction sold 3 million copies, like all of your books collectively have sold millions of copies. You have a very wide readership. You know, when you say something in public, people listen and uh, did you ever think you would get to this point of influence? Well, I dreamed of it, sure. As a, you know, I, I really was a very self-conscious and very ambitious 22-year-old, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to change the face of American literature. But then I knew, you know, other people I knew also did. So it's not something you truly believe is going to happen. I think I'm a little different from a lot of my writer friends in that uh, I came to literature itself fairly late. Uh, which is to say college, and I was I was a genre fiction reader, and and it was it, it was always you know when I first formed the ambition to be a writer, it was like oh that would be a great life you know you sit in a study you have plenty of free time, and you write these books and you make a nice living you have a nice house and um, and you know your biggest problem is answering your fan mail I mean that seems <laughs> and. Because, because to me, I was looking at people like Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, I was a huge Tolkien fan as well. I don't know whether he got a lot of fan mail uh, or lived long enough to, to truly reap the financial rewards of having written those books. But th- that, that to me was what a writer was, and it was, it was, it was a glamorous field. It was exciting. It would be like you'd, you'd have a lot of readers and you'd make a good living. And then you know, I. I, uh, literature was something that became filtered into that kind of reading. I was a, I was a tremendous reader as a kid, but I was reading science and I was reading sci-fi and I was reading fantasy and I, and, and reading mysteries, particularly, you know, just the old fashioned Agatha Christie kind of mystery. And, and so my notion of a writer was formed at, at an, at an age 
and then I somehow, in my foolishness at 22, thought, okay, but I can read the kind of books I've been reading in college and still have that sort of audience. And that was what was what seemed very unrealistic at the time and, and continued to seem... It became it came to seem so unrealistic that, that by the time it actually happened with the corrections, it's like whoa, this is a surprise. I'd given up. I was trying to write those 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 thrillerish, big, uh, mass market books with my first two novels, and I'd ended up with this tiny literary audience. And then when I finally tried to write a, a little literary, well, not little, but you know, small audience literary novel in the corrections, that's the one that that found an audience. So it was it was, it was weird. It was surprising, but but not unconsonant with my ambitions at the age of sixteen. Wow, you know, yeah, it's, it's interesting. How, you know, you can't predict it. You know, you can't game it. I've talked about this with endless writers on this show about like what's going to work, what book is going to pop, like what are readers going to respond to. You just never right. know, and then. You know, the thing, the things that you're saying about yourself as a reader, you know, growing up reading genre fiction really, you know, hits home with me because one of the things that I kept thinking to myself as I was reading Purity is like, you are so good at plot in a way that writers of literary fiction often are not. It's very impressive to me. It's very, because I'm a writer who struggles maybe to, to be quite as, uh, as good at spinning a really intricate plot and to keep creating that feeling of uh, surprise, but inevitability and, you know, I guess like I'm, because I'm a writer, I'm always trying to kind of game it out and like imagine you working on the thing. And, you know, your your book has like this kind of digressive feel at times where like, you know, you switch from one character to the next, you're in somebody's head and then suddenly you're in somebody's, somebody else's head and it's taking off in these new directions. And as a reader, you're like, where is he going with this? You know, which is an exciting feeling. And then to have it somehow all come back together again. <laughs> Uh, like it's impressive. How do you do that? Like, is this something that you're making up as you go or are you outlining and it's like kind of preconceived or, uh, well, there was, you know, there was, there was, there was something resembling a plausible proposal for this book. Uh, unlike the previous two, the corrections and freedom where the book bore essentially no resemblance to the proposal I'd, I'd had and tried to raise some money on. Yeah, this time around, if you read the proposal, you'd say, "Oh well, that's kind of kind of the book he was imagining writing." I did I did have a very conscious intention of going back and doing something more like the first two novels because I do I just I do love plot, and I felt like well now that I've written these these you know the, the corrections and freedom are plotted but they're um, they're really just totally character foreground. And I wanted to go back to something where the the plot structure of the book itself carried meaning, and and felt that I could do it better now because I was you know I, would, I was 25 when I wrote my first novel and I, I I I knew the moves sort of I could I could kind of do a thriller because I'd read so much genre fiction, but now I, I really wanted I, I did want to consciously I consciously wanted to go back and try to do it better. But yeah, you know, you, you can't, if you try to outline the whole thing in advance, it's just dead. And we've all read those novels that feel like, well, the outline was followed right down to the last page. You have to be open to, well, above all, you have to have, a, you have to be willing to listen when the pages are telling you that what you were planning to do are, is simply not working. Well, it makes me think of uh, the Andreas Wolf epiphany about the internet and how it resembled the, uh, you know, life in East Germany. Like that feels to me like, like in hearing you talk about it and then reading it on the page, it feels like something that you sort of discovered in the writing as opposed to, you know, uh, preconceived before you sat down. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and, and some of that came out of when I sat down to write, I felt oh, I would have to do something about his career as a leaker, even though I'm not really very interested in leakers. And I, and, and the notion that this is somehow a book about leakers is, no, it's a book about a marriage. Hello, um, but... <laughs> and, and and also and also a very funny book, which I think is is like in terms of like public perception. Sometimes with you, I think it gets lost how funny your writing is. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's you got labeled as a serious fiction writer, and that people then take the jump from serious to thinking you're not funny. I always only wanted to be a comic novelist uh, at some level. But you know, I, a couple of summers ago, when I was working on the Andreas stuff, it was like I, I just start. I was reading. Oh God, what's his name? I'm blanking on the, the Microsoft guy. There's Mars Off, and then there's um, You Are Not a Gadget. Jared Lanier, I guess is his name. Jeron Lanier, Jerome Lanier. Um, I was I was reading that stuff, so I, I was 
I had some prompts, and that stuff was in my head, and then I had just finished doing the East German stuff, and it kind of pops in, and then it's, you know, it was fresh. It was like, oh, I hadn't seen that section coming. That's fun. So you, you, try, to, you try to have a rough outline building in the possibility of surprising yourself and of, of encountering really serious obstacles that require creative solutions. And what about, uh, you know, to go to touch upon, you know, the success that you've had in, uh, in building a big readership and, and kind of uh, carving out a, a station for yourself uh, in American literature? Like, you look back on your childhood reading all this genre fiction. Um, you were obviously always bookish. But if you, you know, if I were to talk to people who knew you when you were a teenager uh, and tell them, you know, if I could go back in time and say, you know, he's going to be one of our bigger, our bigger uh, novelists, you know, would people believe that? Is that something that you think people could see in you or you could see in yourself at that age? Well, I was, I was a complete social failure up to the age of 15. And then through some sort of miracle, I ended up with friends in high school. And I'm almost alone among my writer friends and having had kind of a fun and happy high school experience. Um, I don't know. I think... Wait, what was the miracle? How did you get the friends? Uh, I tell the story in uh, The Discomfort Zone, but basically it was through the liberal Christian fellowship I belonged to, which this is a mark that it was the 70s. A lot of cool kids ended up joining that group because <clears throat> it was really light on religion and heavy on personal relationships and service to the poor. And so it was this this, you know, a lot of really interesting people came to that group who were not interested in the religious part, and those people became my friends. I, by the way, I feel like that that I feel like the Christian left is sort of uh, resurgent right now, especially among younger generations. Like I, that's just a, a sense that I get from the internet. I feel like there's a lot more interest in that. Uh, I don't know if you have a similar feeling if you've uh, you know in your meeting with young people or whatever interactions with them, but uh, I do get that sense. Maybe it's a Pope Francis thing too. Like he's kind of he's made like you know, the Christian left cool again or something. Maybe. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't particularly noticed that, but I, you know, I have, I, I have good relations with a number of people in their twenties and they, it's just could just be random that none of them seems particularly interested in religion. But uh, anyway, uh, we, there was, we were on some other point. Well, it's just about uh, you. Being... Oh yeah. No, I did, I did the drama teacher at my high school said a nice thing when uh, my first novel was published. I went back to the high school to meet with some students, and the drama teacher was there. And he was—he had been—he was a super cool drama teacher, and all the cool kids were doing drama. And um, some friends and I had written a play and put it up. And he said to me, "You know, reading that play, seeing that play, I knew there was a writer somewhere in that group of you. I didn't know which of you it was. Now I see it was you. That was probably the closest that I ever got to hearing what anyone thought of me back then." And particularly, I have to say, one teacher in, in college, my um, my senior year German professor, who, you know, he was a mess. He was a mess of a person in many ways. But he said, you're missing the point if you're, we were reading the German moderns, particularly Kafka, Mann, Rilke. He said, you're missing the point if you don't understand that these were people. And they were people trying to make sense of their lives. And that that was the life-changing remark a teacher made, which is to say, this is not a game. This is not, and it's not, you know, art for art's sake. There's, you know, the best, the best fiction is driven by some ferocious thing in a human being. And, you know, that's, and it's, and it's a problem. I think, I think it's, a, I think it's something that's hard for people to understand when you achieve some stature in a field you know, you, you, you become the figure and, 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 and it becomes hard to remember, no, that's actually just a person. And it's it's my project in the latter half of my life to remain a person and not become a figure. Because there are when you get taken that way often enough, and you see, and again, not I won't mention any names, but you, you will meet the writer who, it's clear, has internalized all of that and now walks around thinking of himself or herself as a figure. So how do you, um, how do you combat against that? Like, I, like, uh, let me, let me speculate. I mean, I obviously like staying off of the internet and not getting sucked into reading your own press might help. Yeah, um, it does. That but, helps. but also like, you know, you, like not living in New York in the epicenter of publishing and, and being in a place like Santa Cruz where you have access to, um, real natural beauty. Like you've gotten into bird watching, which I don't, it's not something that you were always doing, right? Like, no, no, it, it really came out of the sense of, 
now I have some time to enjoy myself when the corrections took off. It was like for the first time in my life, I didn't feel it was absolutely necessary for me to go and work eight hours every day in the office. I could, I could experience joy in something else. Um, so how yeah, did bird watching is part of it? Certainly. How did you get into it? Like, like what, like how does one get into that? It, in its own way, is not unlike a religion. You tend to be converted by other believers. Uh, in this case, it was Kathy's sister and brother-in-law who are birders, and they took me out to Central Park and opened my eyes to the world of birds one, one spring day in the middle of migration. And once you're aware of this dimension that you've been blind to for 40-plus years, you know, the rest is history. I'm now kind of a crazy bird watcher. But I'm still a bad bird watcher. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not as bad as I used to be. But I make boneheaded mistakes, and I'll hear a song I've heard a million times. I can't identify, and so I, I have to turn to the really good birder and say, "What is that, please?" And they'll say, "You know, that's a towie. That's one of the towies sounds." And oh God, yes, of course. So being bad at something is actually really good, <laughs> or at least not very good at something. Not being by, by no means being the best. You cut, you go every time I go out as a bird watcher, I get humbled. Because I by by the limits to my skills. Well, listen, um, but you you can't be like a great American novelist and a great bird watcher. That's just too much for one man to have. Like you got to have you got to have some weaknesses. <laughs> well, there's also the time problem. Yeah. Because the really the brilliant birders are out there every day, and I just don't have time for that anymore. But it seems like a meditative thing too. It's like a way of paying attention because you talk about like I you know it seems like the kind of thing I I would like to do just being out in nature like. Being out in life, period. You know, you talk about being in Central Park. That's not probably the first place people would think of to go bird watching. But it turns out there's a ton of birds there that are there all the time, and you're walking through Central Park and you're missing them. And that's kind of a freaky thing to think about. There's these incredible creatures that can fly around, and they're beautiful. And I've probably missed like 200 of them today. <laughs> you know, like... Yeah. No, I know it becomes distracting. Actually, I can't if I if I hear something in the background, even in a movie maybe especially in a movie, especially movies which are really careless with their soundtracks and play European bird song over an American scene or vice versa. It becomes actually quite distracting. You, but, you can, and you can differentiate that? You can be like, that's the European bird song. I, I guess you Oh, can. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you see all these European movies and you're hearing, the, you're, you know, a hawk comes along and, it, and then they play the red-tailed hawk, which is North America only. <laughs> you just kind of laugh. It's like, okay, well, that Eurasian buzzard suddenly... <laughs> <laughs> must must have been talking long distance to some red-tailed hawks in North America <laughs> to make that sound. And has this like expanded out? Like I would imagine that like you know if you're a birder that you could easily then get into like butterflies or you could get into like naming all the trees. Like are you like are you getting into that stuff? Just a little bit because if you if you really care about birds, you start caring about their habitat and you start paying attention to well what kind of what kind of bush does this bird like. Um, and what kind of tree does this bird like? Uh, and that's particularly critical if you are in the tropics where you have this tremendous diversity and and species have evolved very narrowly to be dependent on, in some cases, just one kind of tree. So, but no, I, I, the, the way it's gone more has I've gotten into bird conservation. I've gotten into efforts to to improve the world for birds because I love them and. And they're in trouble. They're in bad trouble. The um, you know we're going to lose we're going to lose so many species this century if we don't step in now and do something. And you know I never thought of myself as particularly public spirited. I come from a kind of libertarian Swedish American background, and that I find myself I'm on the board of the American Bird Conservancy, and I'm just you know really involved in often quite tedious meetings but very fine points of a particular habitat or a particular program. And I never would have seen myself as the, per, as the kind of joiner who would be, you know, sitting around trying to do good with a group of people. And the only explanation is that I just love birds so much. And, and when you really start looking at it, you realize, well, you, you have to organize and you have to participate in order to help them. All right, there we go. Another Other People flashback episode, my conversation with Jonathan Franzen from August 2016, episode 426. You can listen to the full conversation. It's in the podcast feed. It is accessible. There is no paywall. So 
track it down, have at it. The Other People Show is offered freely. The entire archive is made available free of charge, no paywall. So please support the work that I do over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. You can do so for as little as $1 a month. It's a sliding scale. You can get merch. Go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash other PPL pod. Don't forget to subscribe to The Other People Show wherever you listen. Please take a couple of minutes and rate this podcast wherever you listen if it's possible to write a quick review write a quick review it helps new listeners find the show if you would like to get yourself an other people t-shirt you can do so at otherppl.com just scroll down look for the t-shirt you can't miss it if you would like to receive my free once a week email newsletter you can sign up at bradlisty.com or otherppl.com and get an email from me once a week coming up next on the other people show I'm going to be doing another Craftwork episode, a conversation with Declan Mead, the founding editor and publisher of the acclaimed Irish literary magazine, The Stinging Fly. You might have read about Declan and The Stinging Fly not too long ago in the New York Times. I will be talking with him about how to start and run and sustain a literary magazine. So stay tuned. Stay tuned.